Welcome to this sample video lecture and today this in this short session we're going to derive the Henderson Hasselbalch equation. So this is the first of two sessions, the first one just on deriving it and the second one with applying it uh, where I'll be asking you to hopefully do some tapping and calculation yourself. So where do we need to start? What should you be already comfortable with? Hopefully you're all right with the idea of strong and weak and strong acid base titration curves. So these are quite characteristic changes in pH that happen when you titrate a base into an acid. You also need to be a little bit more comfortable with weak acids. So a weak acid, remember, uh, is an acid where it mostly doesn't associate in solution. Uh, most of the acid in the solution is undissociated and very little of it is actually this proton that contributes to pH. So if you're happy with that, great. You should also know that we can determine those concentrations using an equilibrium constant, and eventually the log of that, which is pKa. If you're happy with all that, we can see where we're gonna go next. We're going to figure out what a weak acid and base titration curve looks like. What happens when we uh, titrate a base into that weak acid because things change quite significantly. And we're also going to work out an equation to predict what the curve is going to be, though this equation will specifically only predict that region. So without that, let's have a look at the weak acid and base pH curve by switching to the visualizer here. So this is the standard acid-base titration curve. We start at a low pH, we add base, we add, keep adding, adding it, adding it, and then suddenly there's a really quick jump in pH up to basic conditions, and then it levels out again. And that shape is the consequences of the logarithmic nature of pH. So a log is effectively the size of the number. It gets you the order of magnitude of it. And here, when you're adding base step by step, you might be doing quite a big change to the uh, concentration of the hydrogen ions in there. You might be going from 0 0.8 to 0 0.7 to 0 0.5, 0 0.1. But as far as orders of magnitude are concerned, that's actually a very small change. So pH isn't changing much. Once you hit this neutral point, you're suddenly doing a much bigger change as far as the orders of magnitude are concerned. You're going from 0 0.1 to 0 0.0001 to 0 0.0000001 0 0 um, concentration, which is a much bigger change, and that manifests itself in this sudden jump here. For a weak acid, things are a little bit different with what the curve looks like. Normally, we start at a slightly higher pH. Weak acids don't generate as many protons because they're not all dissociated, so you need a much higher concentration to get a low pH out of it. So we tend to start a little bit higher. The instant you add a little bit of base, it's quite a bit of neutralization happens. The pH jumps up quite a bit. And then it levels out, it sort of goes quite steady for a while in a region that we call the buffer region. And then after that, another slight change upwards. And once the acid is all neutralized, all you're doing is adding in strong base again, and it will just follow the same curve as before. So the blue line here is for a weak acid. The green line that I had originally is for a strong acid. So there are a couple of reasons why the shape is different, but we're going to mostly focus on the mathematical one, specifically deriving the Henderson equation. So why do we need to know an equation for this? Why can't we just play around with it? So pH controls reactivity and even the rates of reactivity, especially if you're looking at physiological pH, for instance. So, you know, our blood will have different pHs in different regions, and that controls how enzymes behave. So loading and unloading oxygen, for instance, is pH dependent. So pH is very, very important to a lot of reactions, biochemical ones especially. So maybe we want to keep the pH the same throughout a chemical reaction. Things might be liberating or consuming these protons and hydrogen ions, and that would normally change the pH, and we want to stop the pH changing. Now we can do that with what's called a buffer solution. So I mentioned a buffer region here, 
we can develop a buffer solution uh, that replicates that effect of resisting pH change. But of course, we can't just mix things at random. We need a way of predicting what that pH is and how it's going to change. And that is what the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation does. And if you can maybe pause and read a bit of that uh, paper that's on screen there, uh, you can see a little bit of what Henderson did back in 1907 to work this out, starting uh, with an acid dissociation constant. So let's get on with deriving it. Now, how do we get that equation from the things that we know already? First of all, we're going to start with the acid dissociation constant. So if you're comfortable with equilibrium constants, this is a really easy thing to wrap your head around because it's just a couple of concentrations put together in a ratio to get us a constant value. And those concentrations we need are the conjugate base, a minus there, the charged conjugate base, H plus, that's the hydrogen ions that are contributing to pH. And then in the denominator here, the completely associated acid. So these uh, equilibrium equations here, really useful, but not necessarily useful in this exact form. Uh, that's because these concentrations tend to be ones that are only at equilibrium. We don't tend to have access to those values all the time, but we can still use them. And we can use them to predict pH because pH is obviously it's a fairly straightforward equation everyone should know log 10 of that hydrogen ion concentration. So if we can somehow rearrange this to extract that value, we can get pH directly. So what do we do to rearrange this? Well, first things first, we've got to bring these parts that don't have anything to do with pH to the other side of the equation. So we're going to multiply by that and divide by that. You now we can Pull those off to the other side. So let's rewrite as having done that. We've got Ka. And then we've multiplied by the concentration of the undissociated acid. And I'll swap pens a lot to keep the colours consistent. Uh, and maybe slow me down. So maybe if you want to write this down as well, you can do that. Underneath, we've got A minus the conjugate base. And what we're left with on the other side there is H plus, the concentration of those hydrogen ions that contribute to pH. And Henderson's paper kind of stops there. He goes on a little bit to talk about how the rate of change will of this with respect to the ratio there works and a few other things. Uh, but Henderson generally left it there. Hasselbach came along a couple of years later and thought, well, why bother just leaving it at this? If we took the log 10 of this, we get pH directly. So let's take the minus log 10 of all of that there. Well, the minus log 10 of that H plus is pH. We know that. And we also need to know the minus log 10 of everything else in here. So let me just quickly write that down the right colour, everything that's in there, we want to know the minus log 10 of that as well. Don't need to write that out too neatly because we're not going to use it in this form. So this is a logarithm of two things that are multiplying by each other. So that's A and B, we're taking a log of it. If we take a log of two things that are multiplied, the nice log rule is that this then becomes additive if we split them up. So we can cover separately in mathematics why that's the case. It's a good rule about logarithms and exponentials and exponents. Uh, so it's really useful in derivation like this. So if we want to split this up again. We can take minus log 10 of Ka and that gets us pKa. So just to recap that number, that's a number that just represents a log form of the dissociation constant. This number here can span many orders of magnitude. So if we take a log of it, that's a number that we can usually fit in our heads a little better. But 
we're now left with this remaining part. We're going to minus log 10 of the remaining two concentrations here. So this ratio remains unchanged. So we've got a ratio of two concentrations, log 10 of it, and pH. And that is the Henderson equation, or the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. We can modify pK, which we can look up via these two, um, these two concentrations that we know, and we can get pH out of it. And a really nice thing about logs as well, I'll just rewrite the first part of this, this, is that if we swap these two values around, then this simply negates itself. So if we take the inverse of what's inside a log, uh, we can get the positive or the negative version of it. So we can actually rewrite this as plus log base 10 if we swap those two around. Take the inverse of it. And, we go. and that's all equal to pH. So we've actually got two formulas here that we can use to predict pH. Both are valid, both are saying the same thing. All we've done is swap the inside of this log a little bit. Occasionally one may be more useful than the other, depending on what you've got access to. So we can validate that that expression works and produces the right looking curve. So if you can type it into Excel, you can work out what that ratio is as you're adding base to your uh, weak acid and then crunch down pH. So this graph here that you're seeing is directly the result of that equation as we start adding a base and neutralizing it because these two concentrations are going to change uh, and we know um, what pH is like. Now, next thing that we can do with this is we can actually use this to work out what pKa is in the first place. So <clears throat> if we don't necessarily know what pKa is for a weak acid, we just neutralize it, follow the pH change and work it out. Because if we can get the pH to equal pKa, Excellent, we've worked out what pKa is. And that is gonna be when log 10 of that is equal to zero. So if it's zero, it's not adding anything, pH must equal pKa. So why is, when can we get that to happen? Well, it's fairly straightforward. If we want log equal zero, the inside must equal one. Fun fact, that's actually a mathematical definition. You can't actually prove it or derive that that's true. That's part of a definition involving exponentials and log rules. Um, we could actually define that to be any number we like. Um, we can't because it would break some maths, but you know, it's, it's defined. It's an interesting fact. Though. So how do we get that to be one? Well, simply, we need those two concentrations to be the same. So the undissociated acid must equal the conjugate base. When those are equal, uh, the ratio is one, log 10 of that is equal to zero. And that happens exactly halfway to neutralization. So neutralization in this case on this graph would happen when 0.5 uh, decimeters or so have been added in or whatever equivalence that is. Halfway down there, these two concentrations are going to be equal to each other, and that log 10 thing is going to be equal to zero. So pH is equal to pKa. And so this crosses the x axis. If we go up to it and cross it and come across again, we see that it is pH 4.5. And when I drew this graph out, uh, the graph that we set the pKa to be 4.5. So it happens to work. Let's have a look at what it was there. PK 4.5. PK 4.5 comes out on the graph. So let's just recap that derivation again really quickly. So if we start with the acid dissociation constant, simply rearrange it. We can then take logs of everything to turn some concentrations in that dissociation constant into values, the p values that we know from pH and PK already. And we can also swap the inside of that log around to be a positive or negative. So that's it for the derivation, really straightforward. And 
next session, we're going to be looking at how to imply this. We're going to stick numbers into this actual equation and calculate some pH values.